Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Roger Griffin. I'm sitting here in Oxford in lockdown in freezing weather, and I'd like to thank everyone in concerned with organising this international conference for inviting me to give a, a keynote. Um, and my theme will be the value of rethinking the conventional connotations of what we mean by the fascist era. So I've called it Rethinking the Fascist Era, the Gravitational Pull of the Axis Powers on Political Regimes in Europe and Latin America. And the first point I'd like to make that interwar fascists, and by that I mean those nationalist revolutionaries who fit my criteria for being a fascist, interwar fascists frequently showed that they conceived their own national revolution as part of an international global revolution that would actually bring about a fascist era. And one of the earliest symptoms of that was the fact that the Italian fascist regime under Mussolini quickly introduced after 1925 a new calendar which started time again as it were or yearly time in October 1922 to commemorate the successful but totally mythical March on Rome um, in October 1922 and they called this calendar Era Fascista and from then on every publication would have on it both the Gregorian year and the, the fascist year. So the idea of Italian fascism being uh, part of a, a fascist era, not just a national one but an international one, was well established by the fascist regime. And the fact that I can claim that it was also part of fascist thinking um, right from the start was that when Mussolini wrote the Doctrine of Fascism, which was published in the Italian Encyclopedia in 1932, you get this famous assertion that if the 19th century was one of socialism, liberalism and democracy, we fascists have every reason to believe that this is the century of authority, a century of the right, a fascist century. And this vision of fascism in Italy founding a new international era was concretized in, a, in an article published in Il Popolo d'Italia in 1933, which is dedicated to evoking the idea that the world is now in a transition between two eras, two civilizations, between the liberal democratic one and the, the fascist era. So, for example, the article contains the statement, the last four years of crisis, he's referring to the aftermath of the Wall Street crisis, have accentuated the characteristics of the situation, but the new fascist ideas which are active in every nation in the world, which are active in every nation in the world, would not have reached their present state of maturity without, without the impact of what I would call positive reasons. In other words, f fascist ideas were actually pointing the way forward out of the crisis of liberal civilization. And this vision of fascism's transnational and universal role is cemented in the attempts to set up uh, a universal fascism via the uh, Kaua or Kaur, uh, Action Committees for the Universality of Rome, um, which held a conference in Lausanne in the early 1930s. And of course, it reaches its culmination in the incompleted project to hold a Rome World Exhibition which celebrated the universality of, of Italian fascism in the famous EUR um, which was responsible for some amazing modernist buildings being built in a, an area of Rome. And this wasn't just a, an Italian hang-up. Um, the BUF, the British Union uh, quarterly, uh, sorry, 
the British Union of Fascist Quarterly Journal, the Fascist Quarterly, uh, repeatedly published articles celebrating the spread of fascism as an international phenomenon. Uh, there was a, a book by J.S. Barnes called Universal Fascism, which fleshes out that idea. In Belgium, uh, Jan Streel, who was associated with the Rex movement, wrote La Révolution du XXe siècle, which was uh, an extensive portrayal of the, the turning point from the liberal age to the fascist age. In France, a collaborist, collaborationist fascist such as Dreux La Rochelle, Note pour comprendre le siècle, presents again uh, the turning point that he, he and his country in occupied France was meant to be going through. Uh, hung, in Hungary, Chalassi uh, fleshed out a vision of a European fascist federation in which f four areas of Europe would each be fascistized under the hegemony of a different fascist movement. And in the Latin American context, a very significant book was written by uh, Plinio uh, Salgado, A Quarta Humanidade, where he expresses the idea that, again, uh, humanity itself is at a tipping point and is shifting towards fascist values. So the, it was the fascists themselves who, who celebrated the idea of a, a fascist era. So here are just a couple of primary sources or testimonies to this fascist idea of a fascist era, both from Britain, uh, the fascist quarterly there um, with the Italian fasces, the Roman fasces, but proudly placed on the cover of the book. And there's the Barnes book, The Universal Aspects of Fascism, both very interesting in their own way. This universality of fascism in the fascist concept of history uh, has been recognized in a lot of secondary literature now, a lot of research, um, just a couple of um, examples. Gary Love's um, article, uh, What's the Big Idea? Oswald Mosley, The British Union of Fascists and Generic Fascism is a very well-researched article on the universal international aspirations of the BUF and the way it conceived of its own role in history within the context of an international fascist movement or fascist international. Um, and more recently Daniel Hediger, Hedinger, um, Universal Fascism and its Global Legacy uh, is a really interesting article um, which explores the entanglement between Italian fascism and the rise of a aggressively imperialist Japan and we know that there were uh, very s important dealings between Japan and the Third Reich. So all this is pretty well established uh, way of looking at uh, interwar fascism as both a nationalist and an internationalist movement. Now, one could be pedantic and say, well, actually, the fascist era is, is a myth. From a liberal academic point of view, the fascist era is very easily dismissed as a collective fascist fantasy, a, a utopian delusory vision of a, of a transformation of history which was not going to happen any more than the uh, Third Reich was going to last for a thousand years. This was an abortive revolution. It was based on grandiosity, megalomania, defective reality principles, wishful thinking and collective denial of what was really going on in history and how realistic any idea of a new era was actually going to be, especially given the power at the time of the, of the Soviet Union and the extraordinary resilience of uh, a capitalist country such as uh, the United States despite the Wall Street crash. Um, so there is a lot to say that uh, actually the, the fascist era cannot be taken seriously as a project. Uh, in fact, between 1919 and 1945, fascism only seized power in two countries, 
and was allowed to take over in a, in a third in Croatia, the Ustasha state. Elsewhere, and we could do it on a case-by-case -case basis, but fascism either temporarily shared power, but only as second fiddle to a, an authoritarian or militaristic regime. It was allowed to nominally govern as a puppet regime by, by the Nazis, the Nazis, or it was effectively marginalized, defascistized, de emasculated, absorbed or destroyed according to the country that you're in. So even fascist movements that wanted to join in with the success of, of Italy and Germany, uh, really most of them were, were pathetic attempted emulations. Uh, and so if you approach the idea of a fascist era from the point of view of liberal academic his, history, um, there really was no fascist era. Now, if we turn to the Marxist perspective on the fascist era, we have to take into account the fact that Marxists see fascism as the child of capitalism and as an essentially counter-revolutionary force, a repressive force, the opposite of emancipation, the opposite of genuine revolution, and it, as a force which is latent in all capitalist systems, which when they are feeling threatened by socialism or chaos or anarchy, or they start adopting uh, overtly repressive measures and drop the liberal mask. So therefore, fascism is present latently and sometimes overtly in all capitalist and militarized societies. Um, so some of the more scrupulous or um, academic Marxists might agree that the um, most powerful manifestation of fascism was in Nazism, but they have no problem identifying fascism in Salazar's regime or Franco's regime. And of course, they see Latin American dictatorships as manifestations of anti-communist, anti-socialist fascism. I mean, here's an example from a left-wing journal called Salon or Salon. Um, in 2015, which has a whole article devoted to seven fascist regimes in Latin America, which were supported by North America, by the United States, and has a little section on regimes in, in Argentina, Guatemala, Chile, uh, El Salvador, Bolivia, Paraguay, and Nicaragua. Nicaragua. Sorry about that. Um, so with the rise of populism over the last two or three decades, uh, Marxists have no problem fitting that into their general analysis of interwar fascism and see fascism as rising, as a creeping fascistization of apparently democratic societies and signs that a new, new fascist era is approaching, manifested in such phenomena as the populism in, in America, under Trump and Putin's Russia and the uh, Law and Justice Party in Poland and various examples of right-wing and extreme right-wing politics uh, taking over in Slovakia and Greece, uh, Orban's populism, etc., etc., even Duterte, uh, the uh, Philippine um, leader, is also seen in that ilk, and so would be Bolsonaro. So Trump's presidency, instead of being seen as somehow exceptionalist, is actually seen as, as, as symptomatic of the same broad uh, shift to the right seen at one, of the, at one end of the spectrum in Assad, Syria and the military regime in Myanmar, and at the other, the apparently more harmless populist movements of, say, Vox in Spain and in populist leaders such as Bolsonaro or Marine Le Pen. Um, but they're all part of the same spectrum and they're all part of a continuity between interwar and post-war fascism and quasi-fascism. And here's just a sampling of uh, mo movements or images or posters that suggest a complete continuity between the, if you like, the classic era of fascism and 
what's going on today in uh, earlier, of course, in, in apartheid South Africa, but uh, later we have there Putin and we, we have the B, BJP, Modin, and we have um, the, uh, a, a meeting about the rise of fascism, bottom left, which sees it in terms of uh, the persistence of Nazism, and we've got uh, a picture of Erdogan there as uh, directly associated with Hitler. And we have a moment from a campaign by a, a movement called Refuse Fascism, which associates Trump and Pence with fascism. So broadly speaking, it's natural for the Marxist imaginaire to see a real deep set of parallels and legacies and identities between interwar and post-war Latin American dictatorships and European forms of authoritarianism. Um, so for example, top left, we have uh, a Spanish Antifa and in their mind, there is a continuity between the modern Madrid, which is stopping say uh, separatism in in Catalonia and the uh, and what they would call interwar fascism i.e. Frankism. Um, we've got Pinochet there uh, portrayed as a fascist, Evita associated with Hitler, uh, Erdogan and Orban associated with interwar fascism. It all forms part of a world view where fascism is constantly threatening and occasionally breaking out like sort of bad skin. These are all pimples and boils on the face of the political surface of history. Now, I thought it might be interesting for the participants at this conference to see two examples in uh, acad academic analysis one just before the First World, uh, Second World War and the other at the height of the fascist era in 1941, both of whom are commenting on the relationship between Latin America and fascism. Richard Berhant, uh, a, um, very interestingly, a, um, a, an academic uh, who started off in Swi Switzerland and then became a professor in Panama, um, talks in this article, Is Latin America Going Fascist? of a choice having to be made between communism and fascism. Um, fascism, he says, uh, comprises not only Italy, Germany, Portugal and Franco, he calls it Franco Spain, so he has no problems again about seeing all four dictatorships as fascist, but also Japan, which is interesting. Uh, he then suggests that all over the world, the anti-communist authoritarian, authoritarian right is identifying with European fascism and succumbing to what could be seen as the gravitational pull, which the Axis powers and increasingly the Third Reich exert or were exerting on the right wing uh, anti-communist dictatorships and, and movements. So for him, the fascist era obviously covered both the core fascist and para-fascist phenomena anywhere in the Europe, Europeanized world, um, which included Japan, Latin America, and uh, it's quite interesting that he wasn't aware at the time that there were other phenomena he could have referred to in China, India, the Lebanon, uh, Israel, and South Africa. So his conclusion is that Latin America is not yet either democratic or fascist. There is no doubt, however, that all at present tendencies towards totalitarian forms of government, either fascist or socialist, are stronger than purely democratic. So he expresses this idea that the Asia liberal democracy is actually fading and that the future belongs to uh, fascism or socialism, authoritarian fascism and socialism, and that Latin America is sort of at a crossroads where it could go either way. Uh, the article written in 1941 by the US Marxist academic Samuel Putman or Putman uh, is really interesting because he, he, uh, he writes this, talking about the Vargas dictatorship in Brazil, such a dictatorship once set up as that of 
Vargas was in 1930, must inevitably, amid the intense play of imperialist forces, find a finance capital base and must eventually become a dictatorship of finance capital. The history of the Vargas regime surely goes to prove this. And what is the dictatorship of finance capital other than the open terrorist dictatorship of capitalism, in other words, fascism, according to the famous Dimitrov definition from Comintern in 1935. For the Vargas regime, he says, is fascism. It is an unstable and yet unconsolidated fascism, but it is fascism nonetheless. Now, within the liberal media and newspapers, articles and academic history and politics, that sort of certainty about what is fascist and what is the fascist era is impossible because for seven decades there really was no uh, consensus among liberal intellectuals about what fascism was. There was what I call a, a Babel effect, which meant that a whole load of right-wing regimes could or could not be called fascist according to uh, the definition or implicit definition, quite often it wasn't even defined, being operated by the, um, by the academic. And that led to an incredible vagueness. And it's a vagueness that you will still find occasionally. I mean, how about this from the Madras uh, Courier of September 2020, so quite recent, intriguingly headlined The Global Rise of Fascism in the 21st Century. And he writes, Trump's rise is not an isolated example of the rise of fascism. There seems to be a global trend towards authoritarian fascism. Putin, Duterte, Orban, Erdogan, Modi and Jinping are all textbook fascists. They brook no dissent. They often turn to violence against minority or minorities as a tool of policy. They are all rabidly nationalist. Most of them use the perceived victimization of the majority to direct blame towards minorities. They are masters of propaganda and public messaging, despite rationality and critical thinking. They portray themselves as messianic leaders who are capable of extraordinary feats. Modi apparently fought crocodiles as a child. According to Balnarendra, a propaganda book for Indian children. Putin likes to be photographed shirtless in a ru the rugged wilderness, appealing to his base sense of powerful masculinity. So the author of this article sees a fascist era um, basically everywhere, all over the world, in any sort of right-wing authoritarian uh, regime of any descriptions. It's all part of a fascist era. Now, um, that attitude is not just confined to uh, Indian journalists. I mean, here are little symptoms of how among liberal commentators and journalistic writers, um, Jason Stanley is actually quite a serious philosopher and academic, um, Madeleine Albright is former Secretary of State in America, um, this same confusion exists. Uh, how fascism works is actually about um, U.S. politics and uh, Manichaean thinking. Uh, Albright is warning of the rise of fascism. We have Trump giving a Hitler salute in a uh, uh, wrapped in an American flag. Now, there's a difference here between the way Marxists and fascist and uh, Marxists and liberals use fascism in such an all-embracing way. It is absolutely consistent for Marxists to call nearly all right-wing phenomena fascist because that is consistent with their Marxist theory of the future and analysis of society. But for uh, non-Marxist academics, it's a sign of the massive incoherence in fascist studies which existed up to 1990, where you could find all sorts of definitions or implicit definitions which actually um, gutted the term of any real application, any real rigour. Uh, now this vagueness and its it, the inability to define it was is clearly nothing new. I mean here's Orwell, George Orwell in 1944, who says it will be seen that as used 
The word fascism is almost entirely meaningless. In conversation, of course, it is used even more wildly than in print. I have heard it applied to farmers, shopkeepers, social credit, corporal punishment, fox hunting, blah, blah, blah. It's a, it's a great quote. I hope if you're interested, you'll get hold of the uh, PowerPoint from the conference organisers and you can see how it carries on. But even in the post-war period, you, you got Stuart Wolf, who had actually published three books on fascism, a ba comparative fascism with lots of different contributions by different experts. And he actually says in the introduction to one of them, perhaps the, world, the word fascism should be banned, at least temporarily, from our political vocabulary. And later, another academic was to write, uh, perhaps one day someone will formulate a universally acceptable definition of fascism and will clearly identify the fascists, but that day still seems far off. So for people like that, who are almost in despair about the absence of a definition, it really would be impossible to actually make any sense of the question, what is so really up to about 1990, it, it was impossible to obtain any sort of objective answer about what was fascist and what wasn't. Um, there was no, not even a consensus about whether Nazism was fascist, especially uh, in, in Germany where the term was generally avoided unless you were a Marxist. And there were no generally accepted criteria uh, to establish the fascist identity of such phenomena as white supremacism, right-wing populism, the new right, black terrorism, identitarianism, third positionism, or individual examples of, of uh, putative fascist phenomena like Casa Pound, uh, or to work out whether uh, Christian identity or jihadism were forms of fascism. Now, such extraordinary confusion uh, which prevailed in comparative fascist studies in Europe was bound to have a, a, an impact on the way Latin American dictatorships and right-wing phenomena were assessed. Um, it was impossible to find any sort of clear idea about whether, for example, um, not only whether Salazar and Franco were fascists, but whether Vargas's Brazil was fascist or whether Peronism was fascist. Um, you get curious contorted arguments occasionally such as one encountered in Morodo's uh, Los Orígenes uh, Ideológicos del Franquismo uh, Acción Española. Um, it, it, it argues that Franco's fascism was unique because somehow it wasn't fascist. In other words, the very fact that it did not fit neatly into analysis of fascism and Nazism and other fascist movements meant that it was uh, a unique form of fascism. I mean, that really is uh, worthy of a lawyer. Um, so, for example, if you read an attempt to make, form a judgment, as in the case of Martin's uh, chapter, on Portugal in Stuart Wolfe's collection of essays, European Fascism, 1968, he's clearly at a loss to work out what criteria he should use to, to make an assessment of Salaz Salazarism. Um, uh, in 1980, you get a, an equivalently confused chapter on whether uh, Peron was a fascist, an inquiry into the nature of fascism. Uh, deep perplexity, confusion, no, no idea really. Um, Maybe it would have been better if they had no idea that they didn't write about it. Um, now, there is a nice exce exception to this um, in the chapter of Alistair Hennessy in uh, Walter LeCur's Fascism, A Reader's Guide. Now, this is a curious chapter because it's included in a general uh, comparative studies book on fascism, but it, it actually decides that, generally speaking, Latin America did not host any fascism. And it, it, it sees its dictatorships as overwhelmingly uh, populist and not fascist. So it's a very good chapter on Latin American populism. Um, but even this chapter is flawed by the absence of any real definition to clarify the relationship between populism and 
fascism. Um, in my definition of fascism, populism is one of the words in the definition. So it was generally a very sad period for people like me who entered comparative fascist studies because it, it really was a case, a case of the, the blind leading the blind. Now, when I entered fascist studies in the 1990s, um, I saw it as a sort of task to try and sort out some of this confusion and that resulted in my book The Nature of Fascism which came it seems at the right time because a lot of uh, younger academics and people who were similarly disillusioned with uh, existing secondary literature on fascism responded to my attempt to uh, sort out the confusion by offering a, an ideal typical definition an ideal typical definition based on what fascists themselves were saying. That's a complicated tautology there about working out which fascists you're going to listen to to find out what fascism is, but I won't go into that now. Um, but whatever, uh, however rigorous or, or consistent my own definition is, it, it has helped shape comparative fascist studies. And by the um, by, by the by 2011. There was the journal Fascism. There's now a, an association for the comparative study of fascism, COMFAS, formed in 2018 by um, a group of people, but especially uh, Konstantin Jordaci of the Central European University in Budapest and now in Vienna, thanks to the repressive measures of Orban, which some would call fascist and others would call right-wing populist. And once there was a working consensus about what fascism was, it, it actually became possible to start answering the question about how do we conceptualise the fascist era. Now when I was working on my own doctorate, which eventually became the book The Nature of Fascism, I of course faced the problem of all comparative historians of fascism in trying to map the fascist era and try to make sense of how fascism shaped interwar history. And I've, I, like all historians, was faced with the problem that even though there were some obvious core fascist states, two of them, uh, fascist Italy and Nazi Germany, if we don't include Ustasha Croatia, um, and there were a number of clearly fascist movements which were violently um, set, set on overthrowing liberal democracy and conservative regimes. There were also a lot of other regimes which didn't really fit into that. They weren't that radical. They were conservative. They retained the power of the church. They were anti-communist, but they were not trying to create a new type of nation altogether like the Falange was. So... I had to invent a, a term for that, which I then found later was not original, but para-fascist. And so uh, this allowed me to map the time between the wars as made up of a group of fascist movements, mostly in Europe and some outside Europe, and the rest looked a bit fascist, but they weren't really fascist. So at that time, I was really working towards the idea of the fascist era being quite limited geographically and um, basically confined to Europe. And that would, of course, excluded Latin America, which, which I basically did in the nature of fascism. It didn't fit into the fascist era. I was more intent at the time on stressing that the fascist era was a sort of misnomer. It implied a, a vast period of fascist hegemony or, or importance, whereas I tended to think that this was because the impact of the Third Reich on interwar history and eventually uh, the 1940s was so catastrophic that it had distorted the way historians remembered the period. And from that point of view, my mapping of the fascist era um, made it rather re reduced in significance. But now, because of several things that have been happening, I've, I've actually modified my position. And that's largely because of the work of uh, a lot of other historians who've used my theory of 
uh, rebirth nationalism, palingenetic ultranationalism to define fascism, but they're increasingly interested in the entanglements and interactions and the histoire croisé that link fascist regimes and movements to non-fascist regimes or to what I was calling para-fascist regimes. And if you read the last section of my 2018 book, Fascism, An Introduction to Comparative Fascist Studies, you will see that my approach has changed and that I now recognize that it's pointless just focusing on pure fascism because there's no such thing and it makes sense historiographically to take seriously regimes which aren't pure fascist but they obviously belong to some sort of fascist era and my own little contribution to that sort of scholarship was the project which I undertook with Rita Almeida da Cavallo uh, on architectural projects of a new order in interwar Latin dictatorships in which came out in the journal Fascism in 2018 which focused on architectural styles and developments not just in Nazi Germany but uh, and fascist Italy but in four regimes which according to my definition weren't really fascist at all uh, in Portugal, Spain, Brazil and Argentina and it was very clear that even though they were not fully fascist regimes their architecture was profoundly modified by the fascist era and so it, partly as a result of the work of Yordachi and uh, David Roberts who was a major contributor to this change and to my own work I would now like to suggest that uh, the fascist era does not just include strictly fascist phenomena but also neighboring ph phenomena which used to be seen as rather peripheral in my mind but which actually do belong to the fascist era and reading fascismos uh, iberom americanos fascismos i should say uh, made this realization even stronger because that book with its uh, 13 chapters shows that in every Latin country there were sometimes some really strictly fascist phenomena but overwhelmingly there, there were right-wing militaristic and uh, cons ultra-conservative phenomena which actually obviously belonged and believed they belonged to the new post-liberal world that was emerging in Europe. So I'd like to announce on the occasion of this conference a, um, I don't know how new it is, but certainly new for me, theory of how to conceptualize the, the fascist era. That 1938 article by the obscure Richard Berhant um, about uh, the, whether Latin America was becoming fascist is significant because it suggests that by using the word fascism to embrace um, Japan, uh, Portugal, Franco Spain and possibly in future also Latin, Latin America he is using I think the term fascist in a different way than me but it does make sense that they, though all these peripheral regimes to fascism may not be strictly fascist they certainly belonged entirely to the fascist era. Bern Berhunt saw a world situation in which the anti-communist authoritarian right was fascist or identified with European fascism because of the powerful Jupiter-like gravitational pull which the Axis powers and increasingly the Third Reich exerted on all right-wing regimes and movements in the world especially those where democracy was very underdeveloped or certainly liberal democracy was underdeveloped um, and this is not just Bear Hunt, Hunt's uh, perception I mean take this statement from George Orwell's uh, The Road to Wigan Pier 1937 and he without any Marxist uh, inclination though he is a socialist um, says so he's not using this term in the uh, in the Marxist way because earlier he said that uh, in that quote I gave you he didn't 
believe that there was a proper definition of fascism, which is certainly not a Marxist position. He said fascism is now an international movement, which means not only that the fascist nations can combine for purposes of loot, that's exploitation, but that they are groping, perhaps only half consciously as yet, towards a world system. So George Orwell sees fascism as the dawning of a new world system to rival the emerging communist system. And I think that's an important testimony to how things were being perceived with the interwar crisis. So here's my hypothesis. The extraordinarily chaotic political and economic crisis that unfolded in the developed world from 1905 to 1945 prevented any consent, consensual diagnosis of the state of the world or the prospects for the immediate future, especially concerning the emergence of a new world order. The profound ideological conflicts of the times meant that a, there was a pro proliferation of rival visions of the immediate future and of ideals of a new world which was emerging. As a result, there coexisted fundamentally different ways of subjectively mapping the world in terms of positive and negative forces, values, ideals, and hence a, a proliferation of different scenarios of progress of a new order. In particular, Bolsheviks, revolutionary communists, who after 1917 saw a communist world dawning, mapped it utterly differently from those who identified with an invigorated anti-democratic forms of ultranationalism and who, like Mussolini, saw the future as belonging to fascistic forms of the right. In subjective terms, this emerging fascist era lasted in the minds of people as long as the hegemony of the axis over the political imagination of the anti-liberal right was still in the ascendance and the prospects of a fascistic authoritarian new world order aligned to the axis still seemed realistic. This, this approach stresses the significance of imagined maps of contemporary events, not the sort of mapping that emerges after decades of hindsight and study, but the way phenomenologically people are experiencing history at the time. Now this idea of uh, imagining an era I think is quite important because I think it's easy to get hung up on the idea that there is such a thing as an objective era but I would like to stress the idea that all eras are imagined like imagined communities are imagined, nations are imagined uh, and that it's very difficult in the case of fascism to pull apart the objective historical events and movements which are operating in the, this uh, period of 1919 to 1945 and various and, uh, and, and imag imaginings of what they uh, signif signify and how far they extended. In, in other words, fascist era gets sort of reified and actually it, it does so in a way which is very close to the original uh, fascist type of imagining of a new era that we saw in Mussolini. Um, just to underline the the, the incredible role of uh, subjective imaginary um, creations in the way we think we see the world. I mean, here's a, uh, a, 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 an illustration from an issue of the National Geographic, why your mental map of the world is probably wrong. These are some of the most common geographic misconceptions which are both surprising and surprisingly hard to correct. For example, most Europeans place Africa somehow south of the equator, whereas, uh, as you can see, uh, it's uh, there's a similar misperception of the when people who aren't very good at uh, drawing uh, draw ahead and they put the eyes far too far up. 
And this is a nice satire of um, Ronald Reagan's mind map of the world, the world accord according to Ronald Reagan, where basically it's completely uh, Americocentric on the goodies side of history uh, uh, and a very, very partial view of Central America. Latin America has basically disappeared. The Falklands is huge. It, it, I, I do find that funny. And then, of course, the, the USSR, uh, enormous as the enemy. Um, I just think this is rather neat about how we um, subjectively map the world. And of course, the, it was Margaret Thatcher at the time that was so important in Reagan's mind. So England has got very big and Ireland has pretty well di disappeared. Uh, a recent satire program called uh, Have I Got News For You, uh, in its opening animated cre uh, credits at the beginning where it uh, introduces the program, they an animated the idea of uh, Britain walking away from Europe because of Brexit and actually physically moving uh, towards America. A much closer or more relevant to the present conference or lecture um, is the fact that uh, is this cartoon showing the way Stalin and capitalists and socialists are all imagining and creating a different future. Now the interwar period is very easy to imagine to be a fundamental conflict between um, the two possibilities which were arising in the world, uh, fascism and communism. And this was dramatized architecturally by the, um, at, at the 1937 Paris World Exhibition, where the Nazi and Soviet pavilions confronted each other. Um, and this was so common, this way of seeing things, that uh, even H.G. Wells, people don't realize, apart from the fact that he was interested in eugenics, he actually saw um, the rise of fascism, which would lead to the enduring supersession of parliamentary democracy. He said that fascism was a, not a, a, a good thing, but neither it, was it a bad thing, it was a good bad thing. So the imagining of a fascist era emerging was, however subjective and absurd in hindsight, was actually extremely widespread. By the way, this is a photo montage of the pavilions because they, they were actually physically facing each other. Now, the implications of this reading of the interwar crisis um, could be summarized as, as follows. So for those who dis despaired in liberalism, it was rational for the Spanish Civil War to be seen theoretically and viscerally as the end game, the Armageddon, being played out between the rival futural visions of Bolshevism and fascism, the outcome of which would decide the future of world civilization. So that even if, strictly speaking, Franco was a parafascist and not a fascist, he was still correctly, I think now, in the historical imagination of the time, located within the rise of fascism. The fascist era is thus to be seen as one of two powerful alternative blueprints, imaginary blueprints, projected blueprints, for an imminent new mo modern post-liberal civilization, internalized and actively pursued by fascists between 1919 and 1945. This era was partly geographical, according to which countries were seen as fascist role models and where these models were emulate, emulated, even if only partially and semiotically by, for example, parafascists, and partly imaginary, residing in the fantasy politics, megalomaniacal and paranoid aspirations, ideal futures and utopian imaginings in the inner space of millions attracted to fascism anywhere in the fully or partly European, Europeanized world. The new conception of the fascist era that emerges from this lecture, therefore, is that it is made up of one, what fascists themselves saw as the fascist era to be realized, a utopia, 
but it's also expanded to include the political realities generated by the many proponents of non-revolutionary, non-fascist forms of dynamic anti-liberal and anti-communist conservatism, and that certainly applies to much of Latin America. These subjectively identified with and mentally belonged to and partially emulated what they saw as the dynamic project of the Axis powers to create a new world. Seen in this way, the fascist era embraces fascism and parafascism, Horthy and Chalassi, Antonescu and Codreanu, Salazar and the Blue Shirts, Franqui Franquismo and Falangismo, Brazilian integralism and the Vargas regime, the Third Reich and Japanese imperialism all belong to the fascist era despite their fundamental opposition in terms of the radicalness and revolutionary nature of the measures to be undertaken to put an end to decadence, liberal decadence and the threat of communism. In short, at least until the turn of the tide of the Second World War against the Axis powers in 1941, and still today among ardent neo-fascists, it was the intensely experienced subjective reality for millions that the civilization of liberal democracy was collapsing and giving way to a new era in, in which aggressive communism and fascism were fighting for hegemony. All those who sided with ultranationalism, illiberal Catholicism, anti-democratic capitalism, militarism, and were opposed to liberal democracy, individualism, humanism as decadent, and rejected communism for its radical materialism, socialism and totalitarianism, because it was destroying nationhood and eternal values, all these people, all these categories of dreamers, tended to side with the fascist vision of a coming fascist era. Thus, by the 1930s, the future Axis powers were exerting the same sort of gravitational pull on the world of conservative nationalism as the Russian Revolution had exerted on communists and radical socialists, anti-capitalists in the 1920s. This interpretation, by the way, is corroborated by uh, a recent article by Daniel Hedinger uh, called Universal Fascism and Its Global Legacy, Italy's and J Japan's Entangled History in the Early 1930s. And you can see from the title there that he is uh, conceptualizing Italy and Japan as both sharing an entangled history and therefore creating a sort of universal fascism, even if uh, the it, Japanese regime was not strictly fascist. So what emerges from this rethinking is that the, the far right, the extremist right, associated with black, black shirts, uh, black terrorism, um, is actually to be seen as a highly shaded, nuanced set of different permutations of extreme extremism. There are 50 shades of black and um, I will leave, leave people to read that slide for themselves. What all this does for the understanding of Latin American fascisms is, uh, is as I see it, as follows. Within this context or conceptual framework, the forthcoming volume uh, Fascismos Ibero uh, Americanos exemplifies the value of the new age of methodologically sophisticated comparative and transnational fascist studies, which explores entanglements and histoire croisée with right-wing dictatorships. It also highlights the value of comparing different shades of right within the overarching conceptual framework of a fascist era, that is in the interwar period, in which porous membranes existed between different manifestations of anti-liberal ultranationalist politics. In addition, it suggests that as in the interwar period, there are convection currents today connecting fascism, illiberal radical right-wing populism and democratic right-wing po populism, if you like, extending from Brexit and Trumpism right down to the alt-right and neo-Nazi terrorism. 
It also stresses that even if post-war Iberian and Latin American dictatorships are not technically fascist, there are deep subterranean currents of continuity between the interwar fascist era and the post-war era of authoritarian dictatorships, at least till 1989 and the collapse of the Soviet Union and the collapse of the, uh, of, of the dependency on the far right for anti-communism. In this perspective, the Marxist argument that a direct line of continuity exists between fascism and contemporary radical right-wing populism may not be so fanciful, and therefore liberal and Marxist perspectives uh, and taxonomies can, can at least be partially reconciled and, if you like, shake hands in their opposition to right-wing politics been very long, very tangled, very complicated, but I hope you've been able to get something out of that and I'll now soon find out from the type of questions I will get. So uh, for, for the moment, thank you and uh, good night.